We're dealing with truths unto godliness from Titus 1.1. Paul, a servant of God and apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth which is after godliness, which is pursuing godliness. We're looking at Christian conduct, and the biggest problem we have with that is indwelling sin. J. Dwight Pentecost, in his book Pattern for Maturity, said many of God's children are totally defeated in their Christian life because they do not understand the conflict in which they are engaged nor the adversary against whom they fight. They have failed to realize that the greatest enemy they face is themselves the adversary within. It's easy to say the devil made me do it, easy to uh, shift that blame, but it is important to recognize that it's not just you, and yet it is you. The Bible uses three terms to explain our sinful condition. The first one is the old man. This only takes, this only refers to those of us who are Christians, and so we are the new man, the new being. The Christian's old man is his former life as an unsaved person, the way you were before you got saved. And that is the way you continue unless you change that way uh, once you get saved. The word translated old here for old man means primarily that which has been in existence for a long time, old, and therefore, secondly, that which is old and therefore worn out. And that's particularly true for Christians because it doesn't serve any purpose for us except a bad purpose. The word translated man is the generic word for a human being. Anthropos means mankind, man is mankind, whether male or female. The phrase is used in three verses in the New Testament. Here they are. Romans 6, 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin, that's another way of looking at this old man, the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve, be a slave to sin. So this tells us that the old way of life has been crucified with Christ. Now that is a principle, that is a thing to be believed. It is a thing that um, we don't experience, but it is a thing that happened. But the body of sin is not yet destroyed. You see in the verse that um, the old man is crucified that, for the purpose that, the body of sin might be destroyed. This word destroyed doesn't mean just zapped with a ray gun and disappeared. It means rendered idle, made inactive. This is uh, working to paralyze this body of sin so that it doesn't rear up and cause us problems. The second verse is Ephesians 4.22, that ye put off concerning the former conversation. Here conversation means manner of life or conduct, the way we used to live, and uh, put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, put off the old man, which is corrupt, rotten, according to the deceitful lusts. They are lusts because they are our desires, strong desires, but they are deceitful because they seem to be something that you would want, but it is something that hurts you, something that is bad for you, bad for others. So it is deceitful. So this verse tells us that we are to systematically put off the manner of life of the old ways. This is recognizing them, recognizing what the new ways should look like, and replacing them with the new ways. The third verse is Colossians 3.9. Lie not one to another, seeing that you have put off the old man with his deeds. And so lying is one of the sins that was characteristic of the old man. It tells us that because of salvation, the believer has put off the old ways. But evidently not completely, because he's still telling them, don't do this. All right, the second phrase that... Uh, describes the old man, is the flesh. This is 
uh, not maybe as plain as we've come to think of it because we we're used to this terminology, flesh is bad and so on, recognize that there's a physical meaning and then there's a spiritual meaning. The physical meaning, the physical body that God designed for man and animal, that is the flesh. That's the pink stuff on, on us tonight. The uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 39, all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. In fact, if you take a section of flesh from some creature and give it to the scientist, he can actually check it out. It's a different structure. It's made differently. It serves different purposes. Um, 1 John 4, 2, and the first part of verse 3, hereby know ye the Spirit of God, Every spirit uh, that people would say, I have a message from the Holy Spirit. Then they would give a message that was wrong, and he would say, no, you're listening to the wrong spirit. That's a spirit of demons. But um, every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Here's not, not spiritual flesh. This is him coming as a human. And every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh uh, is that confesses not that Jesus Christ who's come in the flesh is not of God. So if they don't confess it, or they confess that it's wrong, then uh, they're not right. So it is the physical body. It is the, uh, uh, the body that God designed for man and animals. It's used in that sense. Then secondly, <clears throat> it refers to mankind as different from God, showing a spiritual distinction. Romans 1.3 concerning his, God's Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which is made of the seed of David according to the flesh. According to the flesh means the normal human method um, that, uh, of birth. So uh, he was made of the seed of the, of the genetic material of David, uh, passed down actually both by his mother, who gave him his flesh, and his father, who adopted him, but... Uh, uh, they came by different routes uh, from David, uh, his father through the kingly line, and his mother through the non-kingly line. His divine nature, Jesus was the son of God. In his human nature, he was the son of David. Romans 3.20, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So here flesh talking about being a human rather than God. No human can be justified by the law because the purpose of the law was to expose the knowledge of sin. So uh, don't count on this flesh to get you right with God because no flesh can be justified by the law. Then uh, Ephesians 2.11, Wherefore remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, how you were, how you were made, <clears throat> who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So what he's saying here is you Ephesians were from that branch of humanity that is entitled Gentile or uncircumcision and not part of that branch called Jews or circumcision. So just to look at the concept of the flesh here. All right, so the physical meaning, but let's now apply this, uh, see why it is attached to the spiritual meaning. <clears throat> flesh then refers to the human body in general, that which was descended from Adam, corrupted by an indwelling sin principle. Number one, human effort without God this is the fleshly effort, and therefore uh, has a spiritual meaning. Matthew 16, 17. Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou Simon Barjona, son of Jonah, son of John, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. God had revealed this revelation to Peter. Uh, it was not something that he was told by men. Romans 4.1, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? And so uh, here, speaking of the Jews that descended from Abraham, <clears throat> he asked what, 
what what we find, what did Abraham find? But the word flesh here uh, is dealing with uh, our father Abraham as pertaining to the flesh. In this, he's talking about Abraham's circumcision. And he, uh, and he asks, when did Abraham believe God and have it counted to him as righteousness? Was it before circumcision or after circumcision? And it was before. So concerning fleshly ritual like circumcision, Abraham found his righteousness by faith and not by works. Let's look at Galatians 3.3. 3. Are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Here flesh is talking about human efforts. Human efforts aside from God couldn't save you. Will it now make you perfect? Can you perfect yourself before God with your human effort? And then Philippians 3.3, 3, For we are the circumcision, we Jews, he was saying, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. And here, distinct from the Jews that trust that they're going to get saved by law-keeping principle, these were the Jews who worshipped in spirit, had no confidence in fleshly ability to keep the law. Uh, that, that would gain them, at, at the greatest, uh, human righteousness, recognized by humans, but not the God righteousness that they needed. The second thing I want to bring out about the spiritual meaning is it is it refers, the Bible, God refers to it as spiritual weakness apart from God. Uh, we like to think of our flesh as strong and able and powerful and so on. But um, compared in this task, it is spiritual weakness apart from God. Look at Romans 6.19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity, infirmity not being firm, the weakness, of your flesh, weakness of your flesh. He says, you are in the flesh, you are fleshly trained. Therefore, when I talk about this, I'm going to use examples of normal men and of uh, uh, un unsaved life that you'll be able to understand it because the weakness of your flesh, the ability to grasp this in your own ability, for as you have yielded your members servants, slaves, to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, sin breeds sin, even now, so now, yield your members servants, slaves, to righteousness, which brings about holiness. Romans 8, 3, the first part of the verse, for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. So the flesh can only accomplish so much, and the, the flesh fails when it tries to uh, live like God, to be like God, to live perfectly before God. So it refers then to a spiritual weakness apart from God. The third thing is that it refers to the unsaved character of life. Notice how it's used in this sense. In Romans 7, 5, For when we were in the flesh, the motions or the passions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members, to bring forth fruit unto death. So now he's using flesh to refer not just to our normal humanity, which everybody keeps, but he's referring to how we lived before we got saved. The flesh here refers to that, the unsaved character of life. Romans 8, 5, For they that are after the flesh, that are pursuing the flesh, do mind, do think about the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. So he says it depends on what you're after, what you are longing for in this life. So after the flesh, do mind the things of the flesh. So that is, that's the unsaved character. Again in Romans 8, but, uh, verses 8 and 9, So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. This is the unsaved person he's talking about. They're the ones that cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh. You're out of the flesh. Isn't that a weird thought? You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. So he says this is a distinct difference here. Once you got saved, you are no longer in and of the flesh. 
Flesh also refers to the capacity of human spiritual ability. The uh, how, how much spiritual ability you have as a human. Romans 7, 18. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me. I want to do the right thing. But how to perform that which is good I find not. So the limited capacity of the human spiritual ability. In Romans 8, 3b, we looked at 3a earlier, <clears throat> God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, or by a sacrifice for sin, God condemned sin in the flesh. This is a pretty uh, important verse. And a verse, not all of them are important, but uh, this is a very important for considering uh, Christ and the flesh and sin. It's an important distinction. Jesus came in true human flesh, born of Mary. Yet, he was not sinful flesh. This is uh, you know, hard for us to, to grasp. <clears throat> it was not sinful flesh. The description sinful had to be added for precision. So, in the likeness of sinful flesh. So, men speak of the sin nature. Now, I understand what they mean. I understand that that's a pretty good way to, to distinguish the sins that we do and the sin that we are. But, um, dare I say, philosophically, to, to think it through carefully, nature is not the best word here. Uh, we ought not to follow that. Uh, just to say that sloppy wording reveals some sloppy thinking. <clears throat> when you <clears throat> ask yourself, what does the word <clears throat> nature really mean? Well, it means the concept of nature is that which is an essential character. So the, the nature of the pew is to be a wooden seated, seating uh, opportunity. Uh, it's the essence of what it is, you see, the essence. Not, uh, you don't say it has a, uh, a wooden, uh, or it has a, uh, a cushioned nature. See? We have added cushions here, people can sit on or lean back on, but that's not part of its nature, it's what it is, what it is in essence. So the point here is that the human nature is our nature. Um, we are human by nature. That's who we are in essence. But sin is an invader. Sin is something that comes in. Now, we were born with it, but um, even then it was added to our human nature. When Adam was made and Eve were made, they did not have a sin nature. So it is not, it is not linked to the nature of being human. It has only been added, sort of like a tattoo, I guess, a permanent addition to us. But there's going to be a time when we remain human, but we'll be free of sin. So we ought to think of it as a, an add-on, a, a writer. <clears throat> so we may speak of human nature, but not of sin nature. The nature of sin is, is a far different thing from the human nature. <clears throat> uh, let me give you the Bible meaning of nature. Romans 2, 14, For when Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. So, uh, uh, in their essence, they do the things contained in the law. Look all over the world. You find, uh, uh, you know, untutored people, uh, uh, illiterate <clears throat> communities, who have many of God's Ten Commandments as part of their, their law. They, they just work that out. So uh, he says that is part of our nature. Galatians 2.15, <clears throat> We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. Sinners of the Gentiles is just the phrase that they use to describe the Gentiles. That's, that's what a Gentile was, a sinner of the Gentiles. Um, but here, Jews by nature, you, you didn't have to do anything 
uh, that was part of your essential derivation. Galatians 4, 8, Howbeit then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. So these idols were perhaps inventive or maybe scary or whatever, but by nature they were wood or stone or precious uh, elements, but uh, they were not gods. So the Greeks, and here's, here's the, what I'm trying to get at. The Greeks had a philosophy, Gnosticism, and, and others, other uh, thought, that all physical things were corrupt. So the body was corrupt, only the mind they thought of as uh, possibly pure. All physical things were corrupt, that only the spirit was pure. If the fleshly body itself is sin, then they were correct to abuse the flesh to try to drive the spirit apart. So all of the, uh, and, and all over the world, it wasn't just the Greeks, but all over the world there are those who think of beating themselves with a whip or cutting themselves with knives. Uh, they would stick uh, sharp uh, spindles, you know, like, like, a, like a, a skewer. Yeah. Put it through the cheek, put it through their tongue, and out the other cheek, just to be uncomfortable. And they would leave it there uh, for a while, and then uh, all the healing and whatever else they had to go through afterwards uh, just, to, just to punish it. They would put rocks in their shoes and then walk like that just, just to give themselves trouble. Um, this is, this is a, a thing within them that I'm having trouble with my body, I'll punish my body. See? So both Adam and Eve and Jesus Christ had a true human nature but without sin. So it is possible to have to be human without sin is possible. Our human nature has been contaminated with sin, yet one day it will be purged of all sin. So it is not permanent. Um, it is not uh, necessarily permanent. Now this distinction brings us to the final point, and the old man, the old way, is also the indwelling sin principle. So we're not going to call it a sin nature, but it is a principle. It is a thing that is active. The indwelling sin principle. The rest of the message deals with this and is trying to get you to recognize it in your life, in your thinking, uh, in the things you do and the in things you don't do. Two verses. Romans 7, 17. Now then, it is no more I that do it, Paul says, but sin that dwelleth in me. Paul here writing as a Christian and giving his testimony that uh, he was defeated by sin from time to time, recognized <clears throat> that as a Christian, as a dedicated Christian, as a missionary, sin dwelt in him. Same chapter, but verse 20, Now if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. What he's recognizing is that our good intentions to follow the Lord take its leading from one area, but what we do in sin takes its leading from another. This other he calls indwelling sin. Man does not have a sin nature that is saying too much, he has a human nature that harbors and inflames, encourages sin. Specifically, the sin principle does not reside in the physical body. There is no operation you can have that will cut out the sin principle. You know, like dirt under your fingernail or tumor on your liver. <laughs> you get that thing cut out of there. It doesn't live there. But the sin principle resides in your soul. Let me back up to say that uh, the, our Reformed friends think their soul is the same thing as the spirit. The spirit is the same thing as the soul. But God has revealed to us <clears throat> that things that are spiritual 
are connected to God. Uh, things that are soulish are merely the high, highest level of the natural man. The way we think, the way we love, the way we choose, uh, how we mind, will, and emotions. These are the soul. It is uh, something that every unsaved person has. It is the higher form. It, it is not part of the body. The mind is not the brain. Uh, you can't, you know, get a operation on your mind, but you can on your brain. Um, so it is the soul. It resides in your mind, the sin principle, um, in your will, and in your emotions. It affects then how you think, what you choose, and what you love and hate. We use the term love. I love these things, you know. Like I, I've said, I love hot dogs and so on. My wife was telling me about a restaurant she was watching while I was taking my nap. Um, had how many? 25? Oh, thir 35 different hot dogs. <laughs> I'd be there all day just looking at the menu. But, um, or be there 35 days in a row to see uh, what each one tastes like. But, um, you know, those are the things we love and hate. Where do we get these, this idea? Well, that's a question to ask ourselves. Now, since, however, the soul itself resides in the body, it is connected with us, and is somehow connected to the physical body, God summarizes the concept as flesh. So uh, while the flesh means the body, indwelling sin, living in our soul, is also then in the body. Difficult to grasp, but an important distinction. So it is housed in the flesh, your body of flesh is not sinful, but it is the vehicle through which the sin principle operates to translate your wrong thinking, your wrong choosing, your wrong feeling into actions. The, uh, the soul is that thinking part of you that controls the body. This is that link. So it operates from its source in the soul, but operates through the physical body. This is what we're dealing with. Secondly, it desires to control you. It wants you to be dominated by its way of thinking, its way of choosing, its way of loving and hating. Listen to Romans 7, 22 and 23. Paul's testimony here. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Something within me loves God's law because I recognize that it came from God. It tells me how to live a perfect human life. Um, I delight in it because I know God is wiser than man and his ways would be better than, than their ideas. <clears throat> I'm a little concerned about this move of compassion for our public schools that um, they're, they're closing in on getting them all mental health professionals in there to uh, tell them how to handle grief and all this other thing. And uh, if, you, if you get into what the world's mental health is all about, uh, they don't even agree with each other. And it really, it just comes down to they're trying anything that works. And sometimes it works because you just have somebody talk to you about your problem. Uh, the, the Rogerian thinking is, um, I don't counsel. Uh, I, I hear you say something and then I repeat it back to you in other words because uh, you will recognize how to handle it yourself. So it's like looking in a mirror. Um, so we're, we're using the, the least and the in most ineffective way instead of spiritual truth. He says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity, trying to dominate me to the law of sin, which is in my members. 
So it wants to control me. It's waiting for me. It's, it's crouching, ready to pounce. Paul analyzed that his sin principle acted to control him. It was actively warring against his spiritual urges and was trying to bring him into captivity to its leading. This reminds me, certainly, I think would remind you of God's instruction to Cain. He was upset because his offering hadn't been accepted. Genesis 4, 7, God says to him, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. The problem was not his offering. The problem was him. The problem was his heart. He offered it with a bad heart. God says, if you do well, then you will be accepted. You will have the excellency. And if thou doest well, if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. That's an interesting phrase. And unto thee shall be his desire. And thou shalt rule over him. Lieth here is the idea of crouching. The same word, Hebrew word, is translated in Genesis 49, 9b. He crouched as a lion. So you see, ready to pounce. So sin is crouched at the door, and unto, he, he, uh, unto thee shall be his desire. He is desiring you. He wants you. Thou shalt rule over him. That's the goal, rule over him rather than the other way around him. So as a roaring lion, sin crouched at the door to subdue Cain, and he allowed it, as we know, to overcome him, so he killed his brother. Uh, my brother is uh, accepted, and I'm not, so I'm going to kill him. Let's move on then to look at point C. Salvation delivers the believer from sin's dominance. So as a, as a believer... The indwelling sin wants to return you to the lifestyle that you had before you were saved. It wants to cancel out the victory of God over the domination, the power of sin in your life. Here's the passage, Romans 13, verses 13 and 14. Let us walk honestly or decently as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering, chambering means going chamber to chamber, uh, bed hopping, and wantonness, having no restraint, just do whatever you feel like, and not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ, and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Here's our goal. We walk decently, we understand Defined decently as acting according to the way God told us to, to do it. And not in these things. He says, if, you're, if you've gone this far, if you're in rioting and drunkenness, chambering and wantonness, you're not living like God wants you to do. Even in strife and envying, a little, a little more internal sins. He says, uh, you're still not going God's way. And so go the way of Christ and look on your life journey and notice when you fall into sin. Notice when it gets you. And ask yourself, did I pave a way for it to do so? Did I make a provision for it? See? If you had trouble uh, with uh, de uh, alcohol defeating you, as a Christian, you don't want to go around alcohol. You don't want to... Just test to see if you can withstand it. That's, that's poor thinking. That's thinking more of your willpower than God thinks of it. Make no provision for it. See. If you have uh, trouble keeping your eyes where they should be, then don't tempt yourself with, with uh, uh, internet viewing and whatever else. You know. Just don't make provision for the flesh. Don't, don't find... Uh, don't, give it away to, to create this. So we are not free from its influence, but we are free to combat it and win each individual test. We must offensively put on the Lord Jesus Christ, taking on his likeness, defensively 
we must make no provision for the flesh to allow it to succeed in its attack by fulfilling the strong desires. So don't make it easy for it. See. Um, the, the guy that uh, had a affliction with gambling, and he actually had the gambling machines, and so he, he put them away in his basement. They said, why did you get rid of them? And he said, well, I might backslide. Well, I guarantee you, you're going to backslide because you made provision for the flesh. See. Never pave the way for invasion. Never set the scene for defeat. Just don't go there. Don't allow that. All right, let me get you then to point D, that the sin principle operates by default. <clears throat> this is when you just fall back on the way you always did it before. Passive living. You think how, how many times it says, I just want to go with the flow and all this kind of stuff. Well, you know, any debris tossed into the water just goes with the flow. If you have a boat, you have a, an oar, you want to guide it, you want to go against the flow. Passive living allows the natural man, our old man, natural man, our old man, to take control. This is the way we always did it before. It's the way we always thought. It's the way we always chose. It's the thing we always loved. We're going to, by default, go back to that unless we choose to be different. And we can choose because we've been given that power. Romans 6.12, let not sin therefore reign have control in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Uh, uh, just don't do it. Now, they could do it. You see, that's why he's telling them, don't do it. They could do it. They could just go back to the old ways. But don't. So don't let sin reign in your body. It is trying to. This is what Paul found out. It was trying to control him. It's trying to dominate him. Don't be dominated. How many times people try to give up cigarettes when they find out that it's killing their lungs? And then they go back to it. You, know. and you, have, to, you have to see what's going on there. Here's this person down on the floor, coughing, spitting blood, and a cigarette is standing there with its foot on his neck saying, Aha! I have beat you. Is, is that your image of, of self? That these things can defeat you? You have the Holy Spirit. You have Almighty God. Romans 6, 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Don't let them do that. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, this is experiencing the resurrected life of Christ, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Here is the, the positive, the instruments, or even the armament, the weapons of your life. Your body can do the things that God wants you to do. And I've found that if I can get my ha arms and legs and hands and my mind working on the things that God wants me to do, uh, it's an automatic giving of control to God. And they don't fall back into the old ways. I'm not passively living my life. I'm aggressively turning my life into doing the things that God wants me to do. So <coughs> trying to say the things that God wants me to say keeps me from saying the things that I ought not to say. Instead of allowing your body members to give in to sin, dedicate them, consecrate them to God and to his righteous deeds. Fight the fight by living according to the new principle of life as those that are alive from the dead. Now there's a thing that I, I grant to you that I don't understand it completely. Maybe I won't ever. But point E, somehow... The sin principle uses the law-keeping principle. All that I can figure out is that somehow, mentally, psychologically, 
if you are in the thing to please God by your good deeds, that you think that your good deeds are going to give you a gold star from God. To say it anti-positively, <laughs> you should be obeying God because you love him and you thank him and he asks you to do it. So as, as an obedient child, as a loving child, you say, yes, Father, yeah, I will, do, I will do what you want because that's what you want. Okay, if you're not doing it that way, then you're trying to be better than somebody else. You are trying to impress God with your good deeds. It's that law-keeping principle. And somehow, in that way of thinking, it cooperates with the sin indwelling principle. It depends on the old man for obedience. The law keeping says, I can do it. My condemned flesh that I got from Adam, cursed, can do it. And there is in, in the, the root of the sin. Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for... You are not under the law, but under grace. There's that connection that's hard for me to, to grasp, how the one is the other. See? Um, but sin having dominion is canceled out because we're not under law. We are under grace, which gives us the power of God to defeat these things. Christ's resurrection is that part of his saving work that was dedicated to giving us a new life principle. And Paul brings this out in Romans 6, this great chapter that deals with how to conquer that. Listen to it. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that, like as Christ was raised up from the dead, that's the resurrection, by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Recognize that he didn't just have his same old body raised from the dead. His resurrection was the first fruits of the, the way we're going to be resurrected. And that is it's a changed body. He, he left the tomb before the stone was rolled away. He was able to move, I, I suppose, from one place to another without passing between things. When he wanted to, he stood on Mount of Olives and said goodbye, and he just floated up, went, went up, got caught up in heaven. You know, I can't do that. Uh, you can probably jump higher than I can, but I'm saying he's not going to be able to get up to heaven. He had a body that was different. So he was raised to a new kind of life. And he says, spiritually, that's happened to us. When our salvation happened, Christ's death paid the penalty for our sin. We no longer have a penalty. But his resurrection, we are to live in the power of his resurrection. So, um, this is uh, that part of his salvation work dedicated to giving us a new life principle. Buried with him, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also we should also walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, planted, buried, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. To live in the likeness of his resurrection is to recognize that we are not the same as we were before we got saved, but we just have a different belief that with that salvation, we have changed. Uh, we have that ability to conquer sin. So notice how the law-keeping principle calls on the works of the flesh, but the works of the flesh result in fleshly sin. This is, he says it to us, but we don't grasp it, you see. Jump over to Galatians 5, 18 to 21. And if you be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. So we don't do it because of the law. We don't do it to try to uh, obey the law. We do it because we are led of the Spirit. And the Spirit says, love God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. 
Now the works of the flesh, he connects it with the law here. The works of the flesh are manifest, and they are these, and he has this list. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envying, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, they which do, and this is the word proso, to, to practice such things, shall not inherit the kingdom of God. If you say you're a Christian, but you are practicing, it is the common practice of your life to do these things. Any one of them. If that's a dominant part of your life. He says, then you're not saved. You don't inherit the kingdom of God. All God's sons inherit his kingdom. So you're not truly a son if you're caught into this with the works of the flesh. So this new life principle depends on the Holy Spirit's work and results in his fruit. <clears throat> now the Holy Spirit's fruit is shown in you. And Galatians 5 goes on to talk about this. Galatians 16, 5, 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill or fulfill not the lust of the flesh. And then in verses 22 to 23, he contrasts the works of the flesh. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now here's one of those things, as, as Seth was pointing out while I was gone on Wednesday nights. The put off the old, put on the new. And the new that we put on are, are the fruits of the Spirit. Exercise these fruits, which you can now with the Holy Spirit. And as you get into that, as you find your life worthy of this, you stop doing the works of the flesh. Point F, and I have G yet to go, but point F is the long one. <clears throat> the sin principle is already officially condemned. Now, the difference here is that something can be condemned without yet uh, having been taken to prison, having not yet having been executed in the uh, executioner's chamber. <clears throat> but the sin principle is officially condemned. This should cheer us up a bit. Romans 8, 3, For what the law could not do, and that was weak through the flesh, God, sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, or for a sacrifice of sin, condemned sin in the flesh, indwelling sin. It was condemned by Christ dying on the cross. Christ's death condemned sin in the flesh, the sin principle dwelling in us. It has been condemned just as Satan himself has been condemned, yet he's still active, you understand. John 12, 31, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. The devil will receive his judgment. He's already been condemned, but the judgment isn't yet. John 16, 11, of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. He's already judged, but it, it hasn't been carried out yet. In the end, Satan's attack will cease. He will be cast into the lake of fire from which there is never a hope of escape or any end of torment. We find this in Revelation 20, verse 10. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. No escape, no end forever. In the end, the body's soul that has given us so much problem itself will cease. Unlike Satan, however, our flesh is not condemned eternally, but is saved eternally. Romans 8.23, getting back to our Romans 8 passage, not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, we have the beginning of our final salvation, which is getting to heaven, but we have the first fruits of the Holy Spirit living within us, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. We're waiting for this thing to get finished and we get caught up to heaven to be with the Lord with an everlasting body, uh, a never aching head, <laughs> a, a never drooping leg, you know. <clears throat> you as a believer in Christ have received justification and a promise of more. Justification defeats the penalty of sin in your life. 
Our salvation experience has given us the first fruits of the Holy Spirit, but the promise of reaping a full harvest is given where uh, we don't have to worry about even the presence of sin anymore. At the rapture of the church, our body <clears throat> now given to corruption, uh, wearing down, wearing out, will put on incorruption. Our mortal body, subject to death, will put on immortality. 1 Corinthians 15, 53, For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. This happens at the rapture. So our adoption as children of God will be complete. And that completion is all the legality has already been done. Now we are being conformed to look like the true son of God. But the time will come when he, the adoption process takes us to his home. And that's the rapture. Hebrews 5.25, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost. So we have experienced part of our salvation. We are experiencing Another part of our salvation is we fight against sin and defeat indwelling sin as we grow in Christ. And we will uh, be saved when the redemption of our body is, is complete. So he will save them to the uttermost, to the very last part, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. So as the ever-living one, Christ is able to save you to the very last part of and that is your rebellious, sinful flesh. My last point is just a few words. Fight the good fight. You understand, I think, a little better what, what you're fighting against and how to fight it uh, because it's a thing of the soul. But we can focus on the fruit of the Spirit and not give in to the works of the flesh. Three verses. 1 Timothy 6.12 Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life. This is, the, this is the fact of your salvation, that you can fight the good fight, you see. Hold on to eternal life. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou hast also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. So you've made a good start, but hold on to this and, and fight that good fight. So until we're raptured to be with the Lord forever, we are in a state of war. Romans 7, 14b, I am carnal, the Apostle Paul said, sold under sin. We are no better. We have no more advantage. So we're in a fight. We are constantly under the influence of our indwelling sin principle. We need to be in constant conflict with it. If you're not fighting it, it's fighting you, it's probably winning. Paul's summary of his state of war is insightful. So we'll look at this in a little detail here. Romans 7, 25b. So then, with the mind, I myself, in our new man, serve as a slave the law of God, our new life principle. <clears throat> in our new man, with that mind, we, uh, be, we choose to be a slave to the law of God. But happening at the same time, but with the flesh, the indwelling sin principle, I am serving as a slave, the law of sin, the law of sin, the law keeping principle, that I can make myself better by doing good things. So it took us a while to get there, but this is the concept of the indwelling sin. Uh, Paul said it's still dwelling within us. But I, I want you to see it's such a, such a putrid thought. This is the thing condemned. It is the old man. It has been crucified with Christ, yet somehow glued to us with some super glue. We have a, a, a dead, decaying body that's trying to get the rest of us to decay. Paul was to say, deliver me from the body of this death. Deliver me. And uh, that should be our goal. We ought to see it for what it is, not a temptation to go have fun like we used to, rather to, to give in to the corruption that ruins us and defiles us and spoils us. Let's pray. Father, you've given us 
a lot to think about. You've given us the idea of indwelling sin and that it is the enemy that we face. <clears throat> but it is not just an enemy outside the walls. It is an enemy that is still within. It fights us every day. It wants to turn us back to what we were. And if we just get tired of the fight, if we just get tired of, of uh, trying to defeat it, it wins. And so we're to fight the good fight. It takes energy. We need to supply our energy, our spiritual energy, by your word to be encouraged to discover where we are thinking wrong, where we are doing wrong, what we are loving wrong, what we are choosing wrong. We need to transform our mind uh, by the renewing of our mind with your word. And Father, with that, then, we can be <clears throat> bit by bit, <clears throat> day by day, stronger than we were, better than we were, not the person we used to be. Uh, we don't want that. We want to be the new person, living according to the new life principle as Christ rose from the dead. With heads bowed and eyes closed, you may be saying, Pastor, it's a fight. I fight, and I recognize that fight. But taking the principles that you've given us tonight, I want to be active in fighting against that sin principle resident in my soul, my thinking, my feeling, my choosing, to change that. And I want God's help in that. By doing that, I want to commit myself not to my power to reform myself, but to his grace power to change me. If that's your prayer, would you slip your hand up and say, that's what I want tonight. God's help in this for victory. Today, tomorrow, the next day. Pray for me. Father, You've given us then the truth. <clears throat> we are not to doubt it. We are to understand it. We are to see our life through these lenses. Once we recognize the truth, then we have to recognize that this is the truth about me. And then, Father, we have to yield ourselves to your transforming power. Help us to do so. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.